Hi, everybody. Welcome. Glad you're here. Smile back at me. You doing okay? It's a little, it's like foggy and weird outside. It's just kind of, ugh. Anyone else feel kind of, bleh? Okay, all right. You're with me. All right. Uh, well, hopefully this can get you, get you on track. We're going we're gonna to jump into the scripture. Grab your Bibles, grab the back of your bulletin where we take notes on the back or your journal, whatever you've got. And um, we're going to jump in. If you're wanting to know what text we're going to, I'll give you a heads up. We're in Luke 18. Luke 18 today is where we're headed. As we uh, together wrap up this series that we call Welcome Home. Welcome Home. It's a four-part series on core values of our church. Like what makes us tick? I mean, every once in a while we want to go back and just highlight or look at or just emphasize kind of what makes us who we are. And I think that's an important thing to do every once in a while. I mean, um, we can uh, slowly go adrift a lot of times as an organization. Uh, We can forget what makes us unique within our community. And um, we've been looking at these four core values of our church. Hopefully you'll discover um, we endeavor to be. Now, these are aspirational, as you know. I mean, how many know nobody's going to get this perfect? Nobody's going to be like a perfect church. If you found a perfect church, stop attending it because you're going to wreck it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Don't go somewhere else. Don't come here if you think this is a perfect church. Um, we're, we're, We're just like any family. I mean, how many of you have a perfect family in this room? Amen. Yeah. Says the guy whose wife isn't here. Um, Because she would quickly, quickly correct you. Love you too, Eggie. Um, So (laughs) nobody has a perfect family. It doesn't exist. I mean, uh, uh, case in point, uh, part of my family's here. They're back there. Uh, There's my, my dad is in town. There's his wife, Marianne, is in town. Um, and they would, they would affirm that we're not a perfect family, and they're the head of it. And, uh, and so uh, <laughs> they're the leaders of this family. So it's dysfunctional. You know I mean? Everyone's got some level of dysfunction within their, within their uh, family unit. But we try. We try. And that's what we're going to do as, a, as, a, as an organization, as an organism known as the church, the body of Christ. Not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Matter of fact, has a number of welts and, and scars and, and bruises, and, and some are self-inflicted, to be honest, uh, over the years. Um, the church, uh, by and large, has uh, navigated its way and remains um, still, I believe, God's force upon this planet as imperfect as it is. And so um, here's what we're endeavoring to be. Aspirationally, we would like to be a church that keeps things very, very simple. Uh, simple. That's the first core value for us. We want to do a few things and do them as well as we can. Okay. Secondly, to be a, a caring environment. Uh, those environments would include our small groups and our large gatherings. Right. You know, what I'm saying we want to be able to be caring towards one another. Now, um, we trust that that's going to happen best in a smaller environment. Right? It's going to be very difficult in a room of this size, particularly this is our largest service, and, and you would say, well, how am I really going to discover uh, a caring environment here in this room when I'm looking at the back of someone's head? And that's why we tell you, let's get out of rows and move into circles so that you're in a smaller group where you can be really you know, open with one another and you can experience care and you can extend care towards one another. We also want to be, thirdly, positive. So simple, caring, positive, okay? We're for Jesus. We're not against everything else, right? Okay, so we, are, we, are we clear on this? This is, not, this is a very, very important thing. And if you missed last week's message, uh, go online, watch it, or listen to it. I think it was an important time for us to really establish that we're not against everyone else and against everything else. We're for Jesus. And how many know we got enough work just doing that? You know what I'm saying? That, 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 should, that should consume our time. Just to be for Jesus. If you've got a lot of extra time in your hands to be against everything else, then, man, share with me how you do that. Because that's a, that's a really difficult thing to juggle. So we want to be positive. Let me just celebrate a few things. Um, speaking of positive, I, I, I'm, I'm celebrating uh, last weekend. Last weekend between the three services, we had 15. We, just, we counted. We were able to talk to a number of them, 15 individuals. I gave my life to Jesus for the first time. I said yes to Jesus. That's a good thing. And that happens on a regular basis, Right? <laughs> Matter of fact, last week we had a team from, um, from Redding, California that were traveling up, a bunch of young people. One of them who's been in our church now twice. She's led and been a part of teams that have been here twice. She said to me, she said, John, this is really interesting. And I've been here twice and I've observed something that, uh, I, is, this, is this common? 
And she describes, she says, you guys, every time I've been here, people give their heart to Jesus in a regular basis. And I said, yeah, it actually is quite common. Uh, people respond to the Lord, primarily second service, third service, uh, even third service, a lot more than, than uh, even this service. It's just amazing kind of consistent time. She says, she says, John, I'm a part of a church in, in Reading that is a, a, got amazing revival happening, and there's t- thousands and thousands and thousands of people attend. She says, but on a consistent basis, we don't see as many people come to Christ as what I've observed here in Salem. So it's a pretty incredible thing. So we celebrate that. She said, uh, we also celebrate this last Wednesday. Uh, we had like over 200 people gather back in here for a worship night. Friends, I don't know about you, but I've observed over my lifespan that midweek services are kind of gone the way of the buffalo. You know what I mean? But to have 200 people say, we want to worship Jesus, and to come, and, and we're hearing stories even from that night, and then uh, other messages have been coming to me about healings that took place in their lives, uh, some people set free some stuff, deliverance that took place. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that we want to be talking about. Remember, we're for Jesus. We're not just against everything else. We want Jesus to be uh, alive and well in our midst. So simple, caring, positive. That brings us to the final one, and that is Real. Real. Now, I'm working from a, a fundamental belief, okay? And here's my fundamental belief, and I would encourage you to write this down. Matter of fact, I think writing things down is really important. I think write it down are the three most important words in the English language, as a matter of fact, okay? Uh, three most powerful words, I would say, are I love you. Three most powerful words. But the three most important words, I think, is write it down. And, and this would be worth writing it down, writing, I believe the fundamental um, construct that I'm working from when I talk about being real is this. The church ought to be the first and the best place to have real, genuine transparency and honesty. The church ought to be the first and the best place for that. Now, one or two, I saw you nod, and I think one or so said amen to that. And here's the reason why I don't think there's an overarming response to that. It's because, sadly, we've not had a great reputation in that department. So, sadly, we've not had a great reputation. And we've got to own that. We've got to own that, okay? That we've not, we as the corporate body of Christ, the larger entity known as the the church, the capital C, ecclesia uh, is the Greek word, uh, called out ones, This church have not had a good reputation of being open and honest and transparent, okay? But we're also dealing with some perceptions. There's some perceptions from the outside looking in. People will look in to the assembly, okay? And they'll they'll, they'll, they'll put a a bit of 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 a stigma upon what we do and how we do it. There's people's understanding that I think uh, is a bit twisted, um, they're, they're, it's, it's warped, in a sense, of how they view the church at large. Let me just take a second, if I could, and kind of do something really simplistic. Okay, I'm going to be overly simplistic, and I, and I apologize for this, but it's the best way that I think I can capture how many people would view the church. I'm going to put it in two different categories. Some would view the church as a hotel, and others would view the church as a hospital. Okay, let me talk about both of these. Are we a hotel or are we a hospital? Now, I know that's overly simplistic, but just stick with me. A hotel. What is a hotel? Well, I would say a hotel is a place to get away from the world, right? You just get away from the world. You go to a hotel. You, you, you go to a nice hotel. Now, I just put air quotes if you aren't watching me. A nice hotel. I'm not talking about dumpy ones, pay by the hour ones. I'm not talking about that, okay? I'm talking about a nice hotel, you go to get away. You go to get pampered. You go to get, you know, catered to, to be taken care of. You, you really go to kind of suspend reality. It's like, oh, wow, you know, jump, jump on the bed. It's not mine, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, that kind of thing. So we, we kind of have this mentality of a hotel as being a certain thing. Now, I can tell you, uh, you know, my wife and I, so uh, uh, Denise and I, when we had younger kids, Somebody's uh, grandma, grandpa would take the kids, and, and we'd be like, what do you want to do? I mean, and we would just like drive like a half hour down the road to go to a hotel. We're like, and some would say, why are you just going a half hour? You just live here, you go a half hour. It's because I want to get out of there. I just wanna, you want to get out of your house. You know, I go five minutes down the road, just be somewhere else. It's like, what is my house? It represents all things puke and poop. You know what I'm saying? That's it. Just babies everywhere. It's like, ah, you just want to get out. And uh, don't, don't look at me like that, I, you know. 
He said, poop. Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> we can say that in church. All right. So I, you just go, hey, half hour, five minutes, it doesn't matter. You go to suspend reality, to be catered to, to be pampered. And, and if there's a problem, how I many know if there's a problem, you're just going to complain to the front desk. Just tell the front desk, I got a problem, move me. Put me somewhere else. I'm not going to deal with this. I'm paying money. You know that kind of thing? I mean, you may be normally a very, very reasonable and sane and compassionate and kind person, soft-spoken, but you get to a hotel and you're like, I want this now kind of thing, right? You start getting demanding. So are we a hotel? Are we a place to get away from the world? Or are we a hospital? Now listen to this definition for a hospital for me. It juxtaposes against that of a hotel. A hotel being a place to get away from the world, a hospital place to get alive for the world. A place to get alive for the world. Friends, have you noticed this? People in hospitals get honest real quick. I mean, we're not gonna sugarcoat this. Here's my problem. I'm gonna tell you what my problem is. I'm probably gonna go into elaborated detail. I mean, listen, my wife laughs at me so often when I get with my doctor and I'm experiencing something. I just get, I just like, oh, here's everything that's going on. She's like, John, stop, stop. You're just going on. I'll risk embarrassment. I'll risk misinterpretation. I just want, oh, I I gotta get really honest with you. Here's what I'm feeling. Here's what's hurting. Here's what's not working right. The goal, friends, here's the goal for a hospital. The goal for a hospital is not to make you happy. Some of you go, yeah, I work in one, I know, right? The goal is not to make you happy, it's to get you healthy. So are we a hotel where you're being catered to, pampered, you can complain to the front desk, or are we a hospital where it's like, I got a problem, can you fix me? Friends, if you're in a hospital, you get honest really quick about your problems. Why? Because you have a need. I want everyone to say the word need together. Ready? Need. Linda. Linda was 23 years old, and she went to the store. She grabbed some groceries. She had a couple bags of groceries. She brought them out, put them in her back seat, shut the seat or door, got in her front seat, driver's seat, and she was just getting ready to pull out when something happened. Fast forward about a half hour. Someone else was coming to the car right next to her and looked into her car as she was putting groceries away and just kind of looked at her as this woman was sitting in the front seat, hands behind her head, tears coming down her face. She's breathing heavily and she looked panicked. And the woman had the presence of mind to go, ma'am, and pound on the window, are you okay? And she's like, no, no, help, help, help me. And, and the woman said, oh, gosh, okay, okay, okay. And she dialed 911. Ambulance came. Support help came. They opened the door. They said, ma'am, stay put. What's wrong? She goes, I've been shot. I've been shot in the back of the head. And they said, okay, hold on. Now we're going to look. And they started to pry her fingers away from the back of her head. And here's what they saw. They saw that a canister of Pillsbury dough had exploded in the seat right behind her and shot out and hit her in the back of the head, and she thought for 45 minutes she was holding her brains in. (laughs) True story. Now, let's be super honest. How many of you, when you, you know what I'm talking about, the little thing, you have to peel the little edge off. How many of you, you peel that little edge, and you're like, oh, dear Lord, oh, dear Lord, and you just, you just wait, you're just waiting. You don't know what is going to happen, you know what I'm saying? It's incredibly, incredibly tense. Well, they exploded here in the back of the head. And here she was holding what she thought were her brains. Friends, I don't know what you're holding in. I don't know to what degree out of fear, out of panic, out of the risk of embarrassment, you're perhaps not being transparent and open and honest about, about what's falling apart about what you feel like is just being held in by your own will. I want to encourage you today to take a risk, to allow people to help you. It's okay. In fact, I'll take it a step further. It's okay to not be okay. I'm giving you permission today that in our church, in these gatherings, it's okay to not be okay. Now, some of you may look and go, well, yeah, but you and... 
I look at some of your leaders and, no, friends, you have to know, you have to know that every one of us are living and breathing by the grace of the living God. We're all in this. The bottom line is, let's just be real about this. Again, the church ought to be the first and the best place for honest, transparent, genuine life between one another. Now, there's a number of passages I could take you to to support this because I'm a Bible teacher. I want to be able to support what I'm saying through the Scripture. I could take you a lot of different places. I could take you to uh, the Psalms, and we could pretty much just kind of open the Psalms and just pick one. Because David and the other writers of Psalms, I actually landed in Psalms, that's pretty good. Uh, I mean, they're always just talking honestly about what's going on in their life. I mean, you're going to get things like, Lord, why? Why does this happen? Why have you forsaken me? Why do evil people seem to prosper all the time? What's going, where are you, God? I mean, it's really transparent. If you don't know what I'm talking about, read the Psalms. We could go to um, the book of Lamentations. Lamentations, a little known book. In the Bible, just even the word itself causes you to be like, no, I don't want to read that. I'm already depressed. Like, why would I read that? But we need that. We need, by the way, I'll go on to say, we need the book of Lamentations in the Bible. We need it because we need to hear from an individual who is saying, I really feel like I got ripped off. And I'm writing these words and it's canonized in the scripture. Because likewise, is, is, is his bemoaning and his tears and his wailing is going to be in chapter 3 where he says, but great is your faithfulness, O God. Great is your faithfulness. We can live in the tension of both. Lord, where are you? And oh, Lord, you're so faithful. We could go to Lamentations. We can go to Psalms. I could take you to uh, the prison epistles of Paul. And when he's saying, I'm in chains for Christ. And he's not just metaphorically talking. He literally was chained to a wall under house arrest for his faith. He says, I've learned the secret of contentment in all things. He, he goes on to describe the challenges he's facing. He says, I've been shipwrapped. I've been flogged. I've, I've gone without food. I've gone without sleep. I, I mean, he just goes on. I mean, here's a guy who says, man, I, I, I have weaknesses. But his strength is made perfect in my weakness. I mean, you've got Paul being really honest about stuff. And we can go a lot of different places in the scripture. But where I wanted to take you today, I felt like the Lord just put a laser beam on, on a story in Luke 18. In my devotions, you know, we've been in the book of Luke, and I just worked through this passage, and I thought, man, this is exactly what I think Jesus might be saying to us. Jesus was a master storyteller, and he told stories all the time. And the reason I wanted to take you to a story versus an epistle or a psalm is just to remind us. Here's the reminder, friends. Your story and my story are super important. They're important that we tell our stories. Our narrative of God's grace in our lives. And we're not just talking about the good parts of the story. How many of you like to just skip to the good parts? You know what I'm saying? We skip to the good parts. Or we curate our lives in front of other people. We show people what we want them to see. We curate it all the time. We're living in a socially, uh, social media-driven culture. And I'm in the middle of it. You're in the middle of it by and large. And what you're seeing and what oftentimes we're posting is something that's been curated. We'll pick out the photos that we don't want someone to see. We're like, I don't want to put that on there. I don't want anyone to see that on Facebook or Instagram. No, we pick the ones that we say, this is the, be- this is the best plate of food that I just took a photo of. This is the best scene of my vacation. What we didn't see was the fighting all the way there, <laughs> right? We don't get the Instagram photo in the morning where it's just like, you know, messy hair, don't care kind of thing. Some of you do, stop that, but... uh. uh <laughs> But for the most part, we curate. I can remember back to Josh and I went to New York City for a, a Hillsong conference a couple years ago. And we went down to the front. We, got some, we found some front row seats. And we're down the front. We're waiting for the event to start. And people are filing in and starting to fill up. And uh, we saw this girl, young girl, 20, 23 years old or whatever, walk to the front of the stage. No one was on the stage. It hadn't started. But she's there. And she's got her camera out and her phone. And she's like, She's doing like duck faces. You know what I'm talking about, duck face? You know what I'm talking about? And you're like, mm, doing these little duck face things. And she just keeps taking picture after picture after picture. And it was going on for 10 minutes, and then 15, and then 20. We're all, and the whole section of people are like, 
oh my goodness, look at her. And she'd move her hair a little bit, and then she'd straighten things out, and she'd do another one, get the lights behind her, the stage, the backdrop, and she kept going on. It hit about 25 minutes, and I couldn't take it anymore. I'm like, oh, here we go. I walk right up to her. I'm like, hey, what are you doing? Give me that. And I take her phone out of her hand. She goes, whoa, I'm trying to get the best picture. I'll, I'll, you'll, I'll find the best picture for you. And I started just swiping through this one right here. Oh, no, it's got a shadow behind my head right there. No, okay, let's go to this one right here. How about that one? Oh, no, the light's just not right. She was just going on and on and on. I'm like, okay, here we go. I'll give you the best picture. Snuggle up, here we go. And I just, I took it like this, and I got in right next to her. I'm like, here, I did a duck face, ooh, like this, and took a picture. I go, this is the one you're going to use. Post it right now. And we became like instant buddies right there. I got her Instagram handle, she gave her, I gave her, that kind of thing. I found out she's a recording artist, she travels all over the U.S., she's just trying to find the best. Listen, I don't know why I just told you that long story. <laughs> but that took much longer than it should have. Here's the point, here's the point. We tend to do this with all of our lives. We want to show people the best side of ourselves. And we forget that life can't be skipped to the good parts. That there's good, we acknowledge, great stuff, good stuff. There's also the bad, and there's what? Say it with me. The ugly. The good, the bad, the ugly. And here's a story in the scriptures that definitely wasn't curated. Definitely wasn't curated. Jesus just told it like it is. Let's look, starting verse 9. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's a story that Jesus told. Who is he directing this story to? Let's look. Put that back up there, if you would, on, this, on the scripture. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus said these words. Ouch. I mean, it's just so pointed. To the ones that were confident in their own righteousness, confident in their own righteousness, and looked down on everyone else, this is the epitome of pride and prejudice. Pride and prejudice. What does the Bible say about pride? Well, it tells us some really strong words all throughout the scripture, but when you go back to the book of Isaiah, which many have called the fifth gospel, because it's so much about the Messiah. In that book of Isaiah, it says, all of us have become like the one who is unclean, and our righteousness is just like filthy rags. Catch it. Our righteousness. Our righteousness. Before a perfect, all-knowing, all-consuming God, you present, you, you, you show up and go, look, it's like, it's like a young person, you know, like a, a third grader coming with their school project and going, look at it. Now, we as parents love it, but you know it's not something awesome. You know, except for the fact it's theirs. And yet we present it like it's, 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 a, it's an absolute masterpiece. We go, God, look at my righteousness. Pretty good, huh? No. God's saying it's like filthy rags. It's dirty compared to me. Don't, don't take pride in your own righteousness. What about the prejudice? Prejudice, he looked down on everyone else. The Bible says uh, this in Philippians 2. It's verse 3. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others greater or more important than yourself. I mean, we've, we've got so much in Scripture that tells us we can't function out of a place of pride like we're all that in a cup of tea. And we can't look at other people and go, oh, man, stinks to be you. Wow, your life is really messed up, tax collector, robber, evil person. And Jesus is going to use these two guys. And he's going to say some very important things to us this morning. I think he's still speaking to us today about how we can keep it real. 
he uses these two guys, both of which were going up to the temple. Up meaning it was heading upwards in Jerusalem to the highest point of the city where the temple was. They're both going up to pray. Now, we don't know exactly what time in the day, but we do know that a good Jew would have gone three times, 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. Three trips to the temple to go pray. This particular story talks about a time when both of them were converging at the same time there in the temple to pray. Let's talk about the first one first. Let's talk about the Pharisee. Look back at verse 11. The Pharisee stood by himself, kind of aloof, right? You get this idea of like, hey, I'm over here. You're all over there, you evil people. I'm over here. He stood by himself and he prayed. Here's his prayer. God, I thank you. I'm not like the other people, Rob robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. What do I do? I, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I have. Hey, are you catching this prayer? Now, I, let's be really honest here. We all pray somewhat self-centered prayers, right? Lord, give me this. Lord, do this for me. God, I really want you to show yourself to be powerful in this way, and oh yeah, it benefits me, okay? You know what I'm saying? We all have those kind of self-centered prayers, but, but does this one not take the cake? Like, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like them. Wow, unbelievably, what a crass prayer to pray. And you're seeing this kind of self-centeredness that comes in. Not only is he saying, I don't do those things like those people, but here's what I do do. Here's what I do do. Um, here's, what I, here's what I do. <laughs> here's what I do. I, um, I tithe. Now tithing's important. We see it affirmed throughout the Old Testament. Jesus carries it forward into the New Testament. We don't see it negated. All we see is it really just kind of brought up a notch. Like, hey, go from tithing. That's just the floor. It's not the ceiling. Uh, generosity really becomes the ceiling. Like, then just give. Just be a, a giving, generous person. But, but he's saying, I tithe. And we're going, okay, that's good. I mean, the Bible affirms that. I also fast twice a week. Well, the Bible talks about that too. That's wonderful. Fasting, abstaining from something in order to move into prayer. That's an important thing that's affirmed in the scripture. But here's his deal. He had to make this statement. I don't do these things. I do these things. Are you seeing me, God? Are you seeing what I'm doing, what I'm not doing? In contrast to these other losers over here, right? So he's tithing. Great. Now, here's, what, here's the way you need to read this passage of Scripture. You need to read these with a level of, of um, kind of a little bit of cynicism. And you should read it ready to do this with me. He goes, I tithe and I fast twice a week. Good job, buddy. Way to go. Is that what you wanted? He was looking for applause. He was looking for affirmation. He was looking to differentiate himself between the other people that weren't doing these things. And it's as if he was getting the applause of mankind, but not the applause of heaven. Fasting. A Jew would oftentimes fast on a Monday and on a Thursday. What's interesting about those two days were these were primary shopping days in Israel. In preparation for the Sabbath, they would go on a Thursday and they would load up and so they wouldn't have to go shopping and they wouldn't have to prepare food on the Sabbath. And then on Monday, they would go back and replenish for the rest of the week. Oftentimes, people that were fasting, Pharisees in particular, would choose those days to go walk through the market called the shuk in Israel. And I've walked through the shuk on the days where people were primarily shopping in preparation for the Sabbath and it is packed. People, wall-to-wall -wall people everywhere, buying their food, getting ready so they could shut things down for the Sabbath. And there, on those days, are the days when the Pharisees, their hair was unkept, their face was long, their robes were turned sideways, and they're just moping along. And people go, oh, those poor people, what's wrong? Fasting. I'm sorry, what? I said I'm fasting. And they would put out, oh, I'm so sorry. What do you need from me? Is that what you need? Friends, what they're wanting is to give this portrayal of supposed spirituality, really deep spirituality. 
And this is what's been called false humility. You know, false humility is just veiled pride, right? It's veiled pride. I mean, let me act it out for you. This is what false humility does. False humility, and you have to watch me because I'm going to do something visual here. It, it, just, it points to God. Oh, no, it's, it's about God. No, no, no. It's about the Lord. Oh, it's about God. But go ahead and affirm me too. Right. No, 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 no. It's, keep it coming. Don't let it go. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. It's about God. No, 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 no. It's about God. See how we do this? We keep saying it's about the Lord, but then we draw it into ourselves. And that false humility is veiled pride. And friends, do you know how hard it is to keep this persona up? Do you know how much energy it takes for this guy? To have to always present himself this way. To always have to put on airs and to do things that aren't actually authentic. They aren't real. They're fake. You know, how many of you have ever heard the phrase? It's a horrible phrase, by the way. Fake it until you what? Make it. Terrible. Don't fake it until you make it. Stop faking it. And what does it mean to make it? Who determines where making it is? Where's that end goal? And once you get there, isn't it true? Someone just moves the target. Oh, no, I'm not there. What do I have to keep going? I have to keep faking it until I make it. We never actually truly arrive this side of eternity. You can ask a lot of people have worldly success. I mean, very notable, very um, celebrity kind of people, kind of folks who go, wow, they've really arrived. And they will tell you that they never truly make it. They, they feel, they, inside they feel empty. They'll tell you that once they've gotten somewhere, it feels like someone moved the target. It was Stephen Covey, who's a business writer, he's passed on now, but a great writer. He said this, he says, if the ladder of success is not leaning against the right wall, then every step we take just gets us to the wrong place faster. You know, you take these steps up the ladder, you're like, oh yeah, I'm really moving up the ladder towards success. And then you get to the top and realize, I lean this thing against the wrong wall. Friends, how many wrong walls are our lives leaned against and we are completely empty and distraught and we feel shallow and, and hollow inside rather than just coming to a point of honesty and just saying, you know what, I, I'm not all that I present myself to be. I, I, I feel deep need for God and I want you to know where I'm hurting and where I'm struggling. You see, it's that kind of environment, it's that kind of openness between one another that we're striving for. We don't see it illustrated in the Pharisee. He, he faked it till he could make it. But what we see it in is in the tax collector. Look at verse 13. It says, but the tax collector stood at a distance. I don't know if that was because of shame or fear or, or if he was just being teased. I mean, you can imagine, you got a Pharisee, a very notable individual, pointing at him. Thank God I'm not like that guy. Who wouldn't want to just sort of back away further and further, standing at a distance? And the Bible says he wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He didn't tout his accomplishments. You don't see a litany of all the things he's done here. Here is a guy that wasn't going to the temple thinking it was a hotel. He was going to the temple thinking it was a hospital. He came to get right. He had a proverbial biscuit canister exploded in his life, and he's just coming to the Lord saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. I can't hold this in anymore. And he just comes and gets honest before God, and God says, that's the person who's justified. That's the person that's made right in my presence. It's not that one who thinks he's got it all together. It's the one who says, I have deep need. There's an author that I've read for years. He's, a, um, he's not a Christian author, by the way, and, and he's not one who would promote the, the, the things of Christ. His name is Douglas Copeland, and he was actually the one who coined the phrase, literally the first time it's ever been coined, the phrase Generation X, Gen X. Of the gen that's a part of the generation I'm, I'm in. So he coined that term, and he wrote a book years ago called Life After God, and on the final pages, it's, it's, not, again, it's, it's a godless book, but you get to the last page, and the last page and the last few paragraphs, he says something that just messed with me years ago. He said, here's my secret, and I tell it to you with an openness of heart that I doubt I will ever achieve again. 
So I pray that you're in a quiet room as you hear these words. My secret is this. I need God. I'm sick and I can no longer make it on my own. I'll take that kind of honesty any day. The kind of honesty says, I've tried everything. And I'm probably going to go back and try a bunch of other stuff too. But right now, in this moment of honesty, I'm letting you know, I desperately need God. I don't know if you've read the book of Revelation and got to the seven churches in the first three chapters of Revelation. One of the churches has quite an indictment against it. It's the church of Laodicea. It's the one where, you know, it speaks of like, I wish you were hot, I wish you were cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spew you out. Well, right before Jesus says that, he says to them, he says, you know what? You think you have all wealth and you think you need not a thing, but what you do not realize, I'm directly quoting Jesus now, what you do not realize is that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. How many of us present ourselves before God and go like, I'm good, totally good. And by the way, let's acknowledge that there are good times around. We're not just talking about making everyone depressed in this room. We're not, I'm not trying to pull everyone down. But I'm just saying, let's at least acknowledge that when we are doing good, that's an act of grace from God. And when we're not doing so good, that we can be open and honest and transparent with one another and say it. And actually say it. And then have that other person hang around long enough to sit with us in it, rather than just going, oh, okay, why don't you just take two scriptures and call me in the morning? Or be warm, be well filled, take care. But to actually sit with someone long enough. I wanna call us to be people that are super real, and here's why. Uh, it's just like Douglas Copeland said, we need God. Can we acknowledge that? Like, we need God. Desperately, we need God. Uh, I don't care how successful you are. <clears throat> I don't care how far you've climbed up the ladder. Uh, I, I don't even care if you feel like you've put the ladder against the right wall. We, we need God. We need the Lord. And we need to come into a place where the Lord is uh, exalted, his presence is established, and where we can then be made alive in his presence to go back out into the world. A hospital that mends people and get some right, get some healed up so they can go and be a healing agent in places where, where really folks are super desperate. If you ever looked around our nation, friends, we're, we may not be acknowledging it the way we ought to, but we're, we're pretty much, much messed up. It's bad. And there's a lot of need. Again, they may not be acknowledging it, but we as followers of Jesus, we know, we know how he's healed our lives and how he can heal others. Our community right now is walking through uh, one of the most pronounced um, seasons of, of, we can call it copycat, but it may not be that necessarily, but just a season uh, of, of teen suicides in our city, in our schools. They're just, they're coming one after another. Some of you are, are intimately connected to families that have experienced that. People need God. We're going to see a, a, a pretty significant, probably, move towards more and more states uh, doing what New York did in terms of uh, some of those abortion laws. I won't speak to that issue. I'm not fully versed on it. I don't, want to, I don't want to stand up here and appear ignorant, but I can tell you it just is another example of a nation that needs God. But it starts with us acknowledging, no, man, we got, we got a deep need. We got a deep need. Here's my secret. I need God, and so do you. So let's call on his name for just a moment. Let's just pray together and uh, ask that the Lord would, would sink this word deep into our hearts and that we could go from this hospital and go be healing agents out there. So Lord, we collectively acknowledge that um, not only our country, not only our community, but for us individually, Lord, we're, we're, we're desperate for you. We're desperate for you. We're not just giving lip service to that, Lord. We're honestly saying we need you. We don't, Lord, ever want to present ourselves and forgive us where we have as the Pharisee that would just point our finger to other people's problems. But instead, Lord, like the tax collector, like one who's been shunned by society, like one who realizes his deep need, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We join in with the Apostle Paul who says, I'm the chief of all sinners. 
And Lord, may that become this driving motivation for us to get on our knees, to fall on our face, to, to crawl towards you. Not because we're, we're worm sweat, Lord. Not because we, we've not been created in the image of God. Not because we're not children of the living God. All those things are true. And yet the great dichotomy and the great tension we live with is that even as children of the living God, we've got to every moment come back to you and say, Lord, oh, thank you for your grace, for your mercy. Apply it now again to our lives. We don't have to have to fear that we're saved one minute and not saved the next. Lord, that's not what this is about. But this is about having a humility before you, a desperate humility, and then being able to be real with one another and help walk people through the hospital known as the church. So Lord, help us to be that kind of place. We pray that in Jesus' name. Blessings now on your people. Lord, may we go from this place, but never from your presence. Go ahead of us, go behind us, hem us in on all sides, Lord, and commission us to go be healing agents everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen.